Hi guys, Steve here from Boss Sprung Suspension. Welcome to the second episode of Tuesday Tune. Thank you very much for your feedback on last week's video. Uh, this week we remembered to shut off the lathe, so hopefully a bit less annoying background noise. Um, this week we are going to look at the way that oil flow is controlled within your damper. So most of you will be aware that the way that a damper works is to force oil through small holes of some description, small apertures. Um, in all, well, all, almost all, high-end suspension, particularly with mountain bikes. There are two basic forms of these apertures. There are fixed apertures, which have a certain uh, fixed hole size that doesn't vary uh, while it's in use, and we have variable apertures. The variable apertures will change size to allow for a different amount of uh, oil flow according to some other characteristic. Typically that characteristic is pressure difference across the valve. So that means how much pressure there is in front of the valve, how much pressure there is across, uh, sorry, behind the valve, and the difference in those two pressures. So when the pressure difference is higher, the valve opens further. Um, that is the basic premise of it. It can also be controlled externally by some other factor, uh, often pressure or something electronic. All right, so let's start by looking at uh, fixed apertures and the way that they are typically adjusted. So when I say fixed, I mean an aperture that doesn't vary while it's in use, not necessarily something that isn't adjustable. So this is a rebound adjuster out of an old DHX, the shim stack and piston are laying uh, behind it. So in rebound, oil flows through this little port uh, in this shaft. This piston uh, bolt is sitting in about there, uh, and there's this little needle that's normally sitting uh, all the way into the shaft, not where it currently is. So when you wind the rebound adjuster in, it is closing off the hole that goes through this piston bolt. So this needle basically is a wedge uh, that reduces the flow area through that. So that's a very simple way of controlling the amount of area for the oil to flow through. The other type of uh, valves that we want to look at, or ways of metering oil, are the variable aperture types. So we have, everyone has heard of uh, shim stacks, probably pop-up valves, and most likely boost valves. So I'll just take a quick look at the differences between them. All of them are some variation of a valve that when you push harder against it, when there's a bigger pressure drop over it, uh, it can open up further to prevent that pressure drop over the valve being excessive. That pressure drop is directly tied to your damping force. So the simplest one is a pop-up valve. This is one here. The way that this works is this spring uh, preloads this face here. This has actually got a tiny shim on the face. Uh, against, like over a hole essentially. Oil is trying to flow in through there. Once it reaches a certain pressure, it can push that poppet back. So the spring will allow the poppet face to move away from the hole and that will open up and allow oil through. It is very handy when you want a digressive damping curve, that means stiffer low speed than high speed, uh, because they provide a controlled way to adjust the threshold between the two, and depending on the configuration of the rest of the damper, either offset the high speed damping curve or increase the high speed damping curve. This one is in conjunction, and this is not actually a high speed adjuster funnily enough, uh, this one is in conjunction with a uh, a low speed bleed adjuster, so a needle adjuster similar to what I just showed you, uh, that runs through the middle of it. And so those two operate in series and the total amount of flow area is the sum of the area available to flow through the low speed that's adjusted by the needle and however far open the valve is and the flow area made available there. So the next type, the most common type of high speed, uh, sorry, high speed, high performance damper and high speed circuit is a shim stack. Most of you guys will have heard of this. Uh, many of you are well and truly familiar with tuning them. I'm not gonna go into tuning them today, just explaining how they work. So a shim is essentially a tiny, tiny little leaf spring. So these are flexible. <laughs> Easier if I pick a compression one, they're much thinner. So that just flexes away from the hole that it's covering. Very simple. The amount of pressure provided there dictates how far it opens. Um, and that basically means that the pressure can build up uh, with respect to speed in a controlled manner. Big advantage of shim stacks is when this whole stack is assembled, it's only a couple of millimeters high. It's tiny. It's very compact. Uh, they're very tunable because, as you can see, each one of these shims you can swap out for something 
different in terms of thickness diameter uh, or alternatively you can alter the clamping diameter. So all of these uh, forms of valve rely on essentially one characteristic and that is the spring characteristic and the preload uh, that covers the valve. Uh, sorry, covers the port, a big button. So with the shims here, this total stiffness, combined stiffness of the stack uh, dictates how hard it is for that shim to be peeled up off the face and allow oil through and how far it will do it at any given pressure. So that dictates a fairly linear damping curve if the shim stack is not preloaded. A lot of people, uh, in a lot of applications I should say, um, a linear curve is very easy to work with because there's only one characteristic to change with that and that is the steepness, the gradient of that curve. However, if we want to have something that is a little more uh, adjustable in terms of the shape of the characteristic curve, and by that I mean if you want a digressive curve where you have firmer low speed damping, uh, either in compression or rebound, and lighter uh, high speed damping proportional to your low speed damping, then use a preloaded element. And by preloaded element, uh, usually the element being preloaded is the shim stack. So in this case, this is a very standard uh, format of high and low speed adjuster. So this, um, inside here against the, the valve face, we have the shim stack that you can see through there. And this spring, uh, when you wind the high speed adjuster on, is compressed against that face. So that holds the shim stack closed and forces oil through the low speed adjuster uh, until such time as the pressure uh, pushing against the shims is enough to overcome the preload force of the spring. That means that until that point, until that threshold, all of your damping through this uh, valve is controlled by that low speed adjuster. So it makes the low speed adjuster more effective. The reason that these are typically used is when you want a firmer ride uh, or a slower, uh, slower rebound at low speeds um, and you want something that can still move freely at high speeds. So in race cars, for example, you find very, very highly digressive uh, damping curves and that is through some uh, preloaded element application like that. The next common type of valve that we find in mountain bike suspension, and this was originally brought to us by uh, the Kernut shocks uh, on the Foes bikes back in the day, uh, for those that remember them. So this is a, uh, it's a form of pressure relief valve. It is pressure sensitive in the sense that its default state is open. So if you see, you can see the silver thing there, if I push it down, if I push it together, then it essentially closes. When I say closes, this uh, kind of brown outer section is what pushes this shim here to seal against these compression ports, these tiny holes drilled around the outside there. And so its default state, you can see there's a bit of a gap between uh, the brown boost valve outer and the piston itself is open. So the amount of pressure in the damper, because there's a seal in there, the amount of pressure in the damper, which is dictated by the nitrogen charge in this case, holds that valve closed against the piston. And that means that until a certain amount of uh, force is generated, damping force is generated uh, over this piston, and when I say over the piston, I mean there's a difference in force on this side, as uh, difference in pressure, I beg your pardon, on this side to this side, uh, then that valve will stay closed. So these have uh, a few characteristics that are pretty different to most other valves. First of all, uh, they are pressure sensitive. The pressure in the nitrogen chamber varies according to how far into the stroke it is, so it's position sensitive. It also has a, uh, it also has a certain threshold that is tied to its high speed gradient uh, before it opens. So they're a relatively complex thing to get right. In certain applications, um, they're really good. In other applications, really not so good. So if you want something that opens up very freely and feels like a downhill shock, it's probably not going to be one of these. Uh, the exception being the RC4s and the DHXs that had a form of boost valve in them that would allow, um, that would allow you to essentially control 
the preload separately to the gradient of it. They're another topic entirely. So, the last thing I want to talk about is this form of preloading shim stacks. So this is a ring shim. The way that a ring shim works is that this ring on the outside is thicker than the guide shim on the inside. So the guide shim only has, uh, it, it's, I believe this one is 0.1 mil thick. This ring shim is 0.3. And basically its job is to allow for a difference in the clamping thickness and the outer diameter thickness. And that basically means that all the shims behind this guide shim get preloaded when you clamp it in the middle. That provides preload against that face shim again, holds it closed until such time as, uh, as you generate enough force or enough pressure to overcome that. These are very cheap, uh, relatively simple. They're you know, not a bad way for OEM manufacturers to create the characteristic that they want. However, for the average person trying to tune their own suspension, unless you have the ability to model it accurately or the ability to measure it with the dyno, uh, they get kind of complicated. All right, guys, well, that's it for this week. Uh, hopefully there was something new and interesting in there for you. Uh, please feel free to give us some feedback on the videos, leave us comments, things you want to know. Um, there is obviously a lot to discuss when it comes to valves, uh, shim stacks, tuning. That is something we will delve into a bit more in the future, but it's a complex topic that requires a lot of time to fully understand. Anyway, guys, thanks for watching. See you next week.